Today we're in Revelation 14, verses 14 through 20. The harvest for judgment is what we're looking at. The harvest for judgment. And uh, so let's begin reading together in Revelation 14 at verse 14. I'll read to verse 20 and we'll get into our study. Revelation 14, beginning at verse 14, reading to verse 20. And I looked and behold a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a, a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire, and he cried with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city and blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs. What a cheery passage to study tonight. Let me begin by reminding us of what we saw in verses 12 and 13, which actually is going to roll into verse 14 to the conclusion. Um, when you read verses 12 and 13, I'll read them. It says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the spirit that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. And so I want you to notice how it says in verse 13, blessed, blessed or blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from, from now on, blessed. In the uh, Old Testament, there's a, a Hebrew word, esher, and that word esher is, is uh, used some 45 times in the Old Testament. And it means happy. It speaks of blissful or fulfilled or joyful. That's what it speaks of. It speaks of an inner contentedness, a, a serenity, or a joy that is not partial, but a joy that is complete. And so when that word is used, the word blessed, uh, when the Hebrew word asher is, is used, it it speaks of, of the joy that is associated with trusting the Lord and living by his word. That's what it means to be blessed. Uh, Psalm, I'll give you one example. Psalm uh, 1, verses 1 and 2, where it, it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. So completely contented, blissful, joyful, uh, serene, this inner contentedness that comes from God is, is what God gives to the man who delights in him, who trusts in the Lord and, and keeps his word. So you see this in the Old Testament, this word blessed. In the New Testament, there are more than, there's more than one Greek word that is um, translated blessed, but uh, one of the words makarios is used, and uh, that, used, uh, that word makarios is used, uh, which speaks of a person being blessed. It, it's a word that was chosen by Jesus to speak concerning the citizens of his kingdom. Uh, you see that when he speaks of the Beatitudes or the blessings. It, it speaks of the blessedness that's received from, from God's grace. Uh, it results in a relationship of obedient conformity to his directions. And so Makarios in the New Testament and, and Asher in the Old Testament speak of this inner contentedness that, that comes from following the Lord, obeying God, and uh, that's how you can be blessed. 
So what is interesting is how the word is used here because in verse 13 it speaks of the dead. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed are the dead who die. Uh, he's speaking of those who have trusted Jesus. And uh, he's speaking concerning the fact that these are those who have followed after him completely. Now, when he speaks of, and I want you to notice this, the dead who die in the Lord from now on, um, he's speaking of those who have evidenced uh, a true faith in Christ and have done so by living in faithful obedience to him. It's speaking specifically of tribulation saints, those who are in the tribulation who die, but they die with assurance holding on to God's promises. They die as believers do, holding fast to the eternal life granted by faith to them, and as a result, they're blessed. Now, obviously, as I'm mentioning this, this first speaks of tribulation saints who have held on to the faith during the judgments that have come upon the earth. There are going to be those who commit their trust to the Lord during the time of tribulation. As we've been looking at uh, the book of Revelation, remember with me that during that time, the gospel will continue to be proclaimed, and it has done so in various ways. We've looked at the 144,000 witnesses. Then you also have looked at the two witnesses. There are those who are saved under their ministries who will witness. We've even seen that there'll be an angel who is communicating the everlasting gospel. So the gospel has gone out powerfully. It's gone out relentlessly. There are people who are hearing it. And though the majority of the people reject this message, there are those who embrace it. And those who have embraced this message have been saved. Now, those who are saved are revealing the genuineness of their salvation, and they do so in various ways. Again, he says in verse 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And so these are people who have obvious um, indicators that they've come to a genuine knowledge of God. This is the patience, he says. Now, the word patience is the characteristic of a person who's not swerved from their deliberate purpose. It speaks of loyalty to faith, holiness, by even going through the greatest trials and greatest sufferings. And so these are people who hold on. These are people who persevere. The earmark of a genuine believer isn't that they began the journey, it's that they continue and complete it. And so that's an evidence that you've really been saved. There are many who begin the journey simply because they have an emotional response to a message. But there are others who begin that journey and continue that journey and ultimately complete that journey because they've really been saved. And that's the patience of the saints. And so Matthew chapter 10, verse 22 says, You will be hated by all for my name's sake but he who endures to the end will be saved. In 1 Corinthians 1.8, it says, who will conform you or confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we hold fast to the Lord as he holds fast to us, and we have a genuine conversion. He's speaking of this genuine conversion. The genuine conversion, and the way that you can know that you're actually saved is revealed by obedience, obedience to God. These are the ones who keep the commandments of God, and as true Christians, they remind me of the Philadelphian church that we already saw in Revelation 3, verse 8. In Revelation 3, 8, Jesus said, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door. No one can shut it, for you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. So their genuine conversion that is marked by their continuation is all built on their faith in Jesus Christ. Their faith is going to keep them strong, even in the midst of the reign of the Antichrist. The tribulation saints who die will die with assurance because they will die holding on to God's promises. Again, they die as believers do, but they hold fast to the eternal life granted by faith to them, and as a result, they're blessed. Now notice, and we'll move on in a moment, their labors and their works follow them. They're not saved by good works, but their salvation prompts them to labor in the Lord. There's always been arguments about the place of works in the life of a believer. There are those who believe that you are saved because you work for salvation. As a matter of fact, there's a well-known cult called Mormonism that um, 
says that a man is saved by grace. After that, he has done all that he can. So their understanding of grace is actually that you, you are adding to it by your labors, and that's not what the Bible teaches at, at all. We are saved by grace through faith. It's a gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. But, like James would say, but do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? And so true faith always produces labors, labors in the Lord. And as they labor for the Lord, their works follow them. And the record of their service to God will be honored with reward. And so we saw that last time we were together. Now we move into verse 14. And John continues by saying, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man. God's final judgment of the earth is once again in mind. The judgment revealed here takes place at the worst point in this time called the tribulation. Judgment is about to fall in the most severe fashion on the demons, Antichrist, the unrepentant wicked, and Satan himself. And what we see here being portrayed is a final reaping that will take place. We're looking at God pouring out his wrath. Now, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, Paul said, in his justice... God will punish those who persecute you. God will provide rest for you who are being persecuted and also for us when the Lord Jesus appears from heaven. He will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who don't know God and on those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction, forever separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. So we're seeing this judgment that is falling. Now, I'm going to develop this with you. As a matter of fact, I'll say it this way. I'm going to spend some time with you in a moment in Matthew 13. You might want to prepare yourself by turning there because I'm going to take you to Matthew 13, and we're going to stay there for several minutes. So as you look for Matthew... New Christians will probably say, well, where's Matthew? He's with the Lord. <laughs> but his is the first gospel that you'll come to in the New Testament. So as you're turning to Matthew 13, what do we have here? This could be a, a picture of Jesus participating in the ingathering of saints as well as final judgment. Now, how do we know that? Well, I read to you a moment ago, but I'll read it again, seeing that you've turned to Matthew, most of you. And it says, I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man. The term Son of Man is actually Jesus' favorite self-designation. You find him using that in reference to himself throughout his Gospels. He refers to himself in that fashion most often, the Son of Man. Son of Man is actually what would be referred to as a, a messianic title, a title of Messiah. And you find that messianic title in Daniel's book in chapter 7, verse 13. In Daniel, chapter 7, verse 13, it says, I was watching in the night visions. Behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. So Son of Man is actually a title for Messiah. And you find that all the way in the Old Testament. So when you're looking at Revelation 14, 14, and we see one like the Son of Man having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle, this could be a picture, it would seem obvious to be a picture of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this is the Son of Man, notice, and he's sitting on a cloud. When it says he's sitting on a cloud, the cloud is a symbol of the presence of God. He's wearing a crown. Um, this, is, this is a... There are two words that you could use for crown in Greek normally. One is diadem and the other is stephanos. The word diadem would speak of a king's crown, but the word stephanos speaks of a victor's crown or a conqueror's crown. And so what you have here is a picture of a victor or a conqueror. 
So it's a picture of Jesus who is victorious. And so when he's in the cloud, which is a symbol of God, uh, God's glory and his presence, he's wearing a victor's crown, revealing that he is a conqueror. And also, he's involved in reaping a final harvest. And so with that, there's a message that comes, and the message is the time has come to move in judgment. So I told you to turn to Matthew 13. I should have also. And now I will. Matthew 13. I want to read something to you. In Matthew chapter 13, beginning at verse 24, another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Now notice verse 30, let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares, bind them in bundles and burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. We'll spend a few moments looking at this particular parable. Let me develop a few things for you, and then we'll see if we might be able to apply it um, to Revelation 14. When you look at Matthew chapter 13 as a whole, Matthew chapter 13 has a series of parables. As a matter of fact, in Matthew 13, there are eight parables. And so it's a series of parables. When you speak of parables, the basic way to approach that, because all of us has, have heard the word parables and all, um, but sometimes perhaps we don't really know exactly what a parable is. Uh, it's simply said uh, that a parable is a story that it has, a, uh, is a, has a heavenly message that is couched in earthly language. And so it's a story about heaven that is given to us in such a way that we can understand it because the things said in the story are things we can associate with and identify with. And so Jesus gave parables quite often. As a matter of fact, it was a rabbinic technique during the time of Christ to give stories because stories have a tendency of drawing the attention of the listener. When I teach, and I do this all the time, and you'll notice this, and I've given this away more than once, but when I teach, very often what I'll do is I'll be giving you some doctrine. I'll be saying cross-reference this with this, and this scripture says this. And at a certain point, the church begins to glaze. It does. Not everybody. Some are just flat out asleep, but others are glazing. <laughs> and at that point, I'll say, I'll do exactly what I'm doing right now. I'll get your attention again. That's what I do. I might tell a story, share a joke, and what does it do? It, it has a tendency, this is just a speaker's technique. It's what we do. It, we are able to grab your attention again especially right now in the 21st century when people's ability to concentrate is limited to one and a half minutes. That's a fact. That's a fact, yeah. One and a half minutes. Uh, anyway, I could go out and see, I, I get caught up with those things and I thought, oh, you didn't know that. Let me tell you more. But no, but that. <laughs> and so Jesus would use a technique to communicate that help people to understand heavenly truth. So that's why he'd speak of an ox. That's why he would speak of a sheep. That's why he'd speak of, of a gold coin. That's why he'd speak of, of, a, of a prodigal son, or a son who was accused to be prodigal. That's why he would do that, because when he would illustrate his rabbinic teachings, it would grab the individuals, and they would listen. And all you need to do, if you want to compare that technique, you can do so in the New Testament by simply looking at the messages of Christ and then read the epistles of the Apostle Paul. And you see the difference. 
because Jesus illustrated quite often. And so in Matthew 13, Jesus used parables, eight of them. Now, the very first parable, everybody knows it's found in verses 1 through 23. It's a parable of the sower and the seed. And as Jesus begins to speak in that passage, he begins to speak concerning seed that is sown on the wayside or in stony places or on, uh, amongst the thorns. And then he speaks concerning the seed that is thrown on good soil. So that's how he begins by sharing his series of parables in Matthew 13. Now, in his first parable that lays the foundation for the other seven in Matthew 13, Jesus speaks concerning the good seed. The good seed, that which receives the, uh, the word of God and produces fruit, is the church. The church receives the gospel and produces fruits that demonstrate repentance. And part of that fruit will be the evangelization of the world. That's what Jesus intends the church to do, right? To take this gospel and to communicate it. You see that in Matthew 13, verses 1 through 23. So after Jesus gives this first parable, he begins to reveal the fruit of the ministry of the good soil. And from there, he actually gives three parables that reveal something about the church. And as he gives these three parables re referring to the church, uh, the parables point out that the church, the church is going to grow large, but it is also going to be infected. So he gives a parable of the wheat and tares. He also gives a parable of the mustard seed, and he gives a parable of leaven. And so the parable of, of wheat and tares actually fits into what we see in Revelation 14. Because as he's speaking concerning these things, he gives us some insight. And I want to develop this with you so you can see why Revelation 14 that we're looking at today, verse 14 following, uh, why this parable here can fit into that and give us understanding about the Son of Man and the reaping. And so, in the parable of the wheat and tares, and I'm going to spend some time with you here. You might want to relax. A man sows good seed, but an enemy sows tares. When Jesus speaks concerning this good seed and the tares, the good seed would be the word of God that had an impact in people's life, and they received it and produced fruit. But the tares, the tares are weeds. The, the word uh, is darnel. We use the word darnel today. And... Darnel is, 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 a, is a weed. It, it has the appearance of wheat, but you really don't know that it's not the real thing until it's fully matured. The wheat produces grain. The darnel doesn't. There's no fruit. But as it's growing up, it looks exactly the same. And that's the point that Jesus is making in this particular parable. Now, in verses 36 through 43, Jesus actually explains this, and I'm going to read it to you, then I'm going to spend some time developing this, because I, I think that once the foundation is laid for you, you're going to get, I think there'll be some interest that, that you'll have. In verse 36, Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. His disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said to them, no way, I don't want to. No, he he answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. The tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. The reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. So you see 
Revelation 14 in Matthew 13. Now, I want to develop that a little bit with you for just a moment. Because there's some practical application that I want to reach here. The sower is Jesus. The field is the world. Good seeds, the word of God that has found its home in people. The good seed, Christians. The tares, unbelievers. Jesus is revealed as sowing good seed because the gospel is good. He does so over a period of time. How is the good seed sowed into the world? Through the proclamation of the gospel. In Matthew 28, 19 and 20, Go there, therefore make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so the good seed believers who go forth producing fruit you have the body of Christ. Within the body of Christ, the church, you also have Darnell. In verse 25, he said something, and I want to develop this. While men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. How did that happen? That unbelievers were sowed into the church? Notice it says it was asleep while well, men slept. During its sleep, an enemy slips in and unbelievers are sown in amongst the genuine wheat. What happens is the church over time loses its vigilance. Loses its vigilance. How could non-Christians ever be comfortable in a church that actually teaches the Word of God. Uh, this is one of those subjects that I actually can speak on a long time and I have to be careful not to because there's a whole movement that I've been observing for many years now that basically invites those who don't know Christ to come in as what is called the church. And the messages that are given are so watered down, there's no conviction whatsoever, ever. In the church. Not that people should come into church, by the way, and get beaten up. Oh, I'm glad you're here for your weekly beating. <laughs> but I have discovered, so have you, that when truth is spoken, sometimes, sometimes we say, oh, bless you, Lord, I have been doing the right thing, and we rejoice. And then when we're reading the Bible, you can be convicted. So the sword is double edged. There are times when, when, when we, are, we actually sense a conviction uh, to the point of having a painful response. So when the word of God goes forth, if it's rightly divided, I promise you, there will be times when all of us will come under conviction in one form or another and will say to the Lord, God, be merciful to me. I haven't been doing that. Forgive me, Lord. So how could someone who doesn't know the Lord ever become comfortable in church services. How? The word of God isn't being taught. While well, men slept. That is the condition, my friends, of the church in many places today in the United States and throughout the world. That's what's taking place right now, even as we're looking at this passage, where the word of God isn't being taught. It isn't being taught on a weekly basis. It isn't being taught from cover to cover. It simply is not. How does the church get infiltrated by the enemy? How could sons of the wicked one ever pass as sons of the kingdom? Scripture reveals that the church becomes tainted and impure. Remember, there's a difference between what has been called the visible church and the invisible church. The visible church is the external membership of any congregation. But that simply means that people congregated in a building and said they're going to church. The invisible church is the true church, the church that's known really only unto God. And whenever the church gathers, there will be members of the invisible church, the genuine article, 
But amongst the congregation, those who are seated out there, there will be those who really don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. So every church congregation will have a mixture of saved and unsaved individuals present at any time. The invisible church is the genuine article. These are people who believe in and know Christ. They're the ones who are faithful to the Lord. They're the ones who understand and value the gospel message, and they're the ones that the message of salvation has found a home in. And because this is the message of salvation, Christians are to be prepared to not only present, but also to defend its message. And the reason that we are to do so is because we've been entrusted with the message and therefore are to guard it because it's the only message God ever gave to man whereby an individual must adhere to believe, must be convinced by in order to be saved. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 17, the apostle Paul said of himself in this way, he said, I am set for the defense of the gospel. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20, he said, O oh, Timothy, guard that which was committed to your trust. In 2 Timothy 1, 13 and 14, he said, Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. So men slept. The church over time ceases being on guard, ceases defending the gospel. As the church is asleep in the light, the enemy infiltrates and infects the church. How does that happen? Let me give you a couple of things. One, there's an absence of solid Bible teaching. I already mentioned that. When there's an absence, by the way, of solid Bible teaching, the Bible ceases being trusted as the word of God to men. The result is carnality and a rejection of truth. When the word of God is taught faithfully, people can grow. But there's a time when sound doctrine will no longer be tolerated. We have seen that to be true throughout Europe. I've spent a considerable time in Europe. I've traveled Europe in many countries since 1975. I have been in churches that at one time were vibrant churches, vibrant churches, alive churches that have been turned into dance halls, coffee shops, bookstores. There are churches in England that at one time were vibrant, alive churches that have been turned into mosques. There are churches even in the United States, even here in our area, at one time had congregations of people who come on Sunday to worship Jesus Christ, and it is now a playhouse or it's something like that. I've seen it. You've seen it too. I used, on Euclid in, in Ontario, I used to live off of Princeton, right off of Euclid, and I would go by Chafee High School, and I'd go south from Chafee, going towards the 60 freeway. And off to the west on my right side was a small church. And when Marie and I were living in Ontario, I would look at this small church that sat about 200 people. And I used to say to Marie, I would love to buy that church. Oh, I'd love it. It's a beautiful little church. I love to buy it. It's a bank now. It's a bank. You can go buy it. You'll see it. It's a bank. It's right there. That happened. How? How? What happened? How did churches get turned into banks or playhouses? What happened? We're seeing it right now, guys. We need to be awake. It happens, Jesus said, while men slept. The things that mattered ceased mattering. It doesn't matter anymore. There is a time coming, Paul said, when men will no longer endure healthy teaching, but will heap, heap unto themselves teachers, having itching ears, and will be turned aside from the truth, and will be turned unto fables. We're living in that time now. So you can have somebody stand up and say, let's face it, worship is all about you. And that's what we have even right now. Under those conditions, the spirit and the word's conviction is rejected because if church is really all about me, then anything that doesn't make me feel good 
is going to be judged as harsh and unloving and overly critical. And is that not the spirit of this age? Tolerance is a new virtue. Tolerance should be given to everybody except Christians because Christians are all harsh, mean, and judgmental. And one of the things that has been said of me, and some would say it's probably true, but it's been said of me, is that he's a hate, he's a, he's, he gives out hate speech. And uh, I hate whoever said that. <laughs> Well, because people are absolutely narcissistic. They're self-centered. Is narcissism something that the Bible speaks about? Listen to this. Mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. And then he goes on to say, have nothing to do with them. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. They have an outward appearance of religious devotion, but they're not saved. False teachers ultimately infiltrate the church. They introduce error in the guise of truth. And because the average member doesn't know scripture, they don't even notice. It's like that proverbial frog in the kettle. Will you drop the frog in and the, because the frog can't tell the, the temperature change? It can actually remain in that kettle of water with the heat turned on until it boils to death, not even noticing what has taken place around them. And when we aren't in the word of God, you will have things told to you that you'll think are true because you're not reading the word able to discern for yourself. Second Peter 2, 1 through 3 says, There were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. Many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle. Their destruction does not slumber. What is the result of all of this? The visible church is infiltrated by evil. Now, when all of that's taking place, the servants of the owner come up to the owner. Didn't we sow good seed in your field? Would you like us to go and just root them out? How come there are tares there? Well, an enemy did this. Well, we can go gather them. What's he say? No. Lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. He said, let them both grow together until the harvest. And at that time, the har time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares, bind them in bundles to burn them, gather the wheat into my barn. The temptation would be to use our own efforts to clean up the church. Sometimes I've had people who have, who have written me letters suggesting that I do that. Can you preach a series on this so we can clean out the sin of the church? And I say, Raul, you take care of your own church. I don't... <laughs> can we clean out the church? I have discovered something, guys. The Spirit has a good way of cleaning up his church. If the word of God goes forth, those who love Jesus will stay. Those who don't, if the Lord will find an excuse to, to do something else. That's just the way it is. And that doesn't mean that, that uh, people who have left here don't love the Lord. I didn't mean it to sound that way. What I do mean is that when the word of God goes forth, it has a way of cleaning the church and keeping it pure. That's what it does. Notice that he had said in verses 39 through 41 that the wheat and tares will coexist until the end of the age. So at Jesus' second coming, the genuine believer in Jesus is separated from unbelievers. The reapers, he says, are the angels, and they're the ones who come with the Lord. You see, in Matthew 16, 27, he said, the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he'll reward each person according to what he's done. So the good grain, 
is removed. The rest brought into judgment. And ultimately in verses 42 and 43 here in Matthew 13, uh, on judgment day, those who didn't know Christ will be judged. And we'll see that in detail when we get to Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. And so turning back and concluding Revelation 14, I wanted to fill that with that, that portion of Scripture. The harvest of the earth, the time for the harvest is come. So verse uh, 17, another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. He also having a sharp sickle. Another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire, and he cried with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle, gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for grapes are fully ripe. The angel thrust the sickle into the earth, gathered the vine of the earth, threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. The winepress was trampled outside the city. Blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs which is about 184 miles. The wine press, trampled outside the city. Blood comes out of the wine press. In the Old Testament book of Joel, chapter 3, verse 13, it reads, swing the sickle, the harvest is ripe. Come trample the grapes, the wine press is full. The vats overflow, so great is their wickedness. This is leading to the final battles of Armageddon. Verse 20, actually 19 and 20, really are describing what's going to take place in the final war, the final campaign. And that's what we will be looking at when we get to chapter 19, Armageddon. But that's a picture of it. The church continues to exist. Witnesses go forth, bringing the message even in tribulation. There are people who are saved. But when it comes to the very end, when it closes in, and next time we're together in chapter 15 and 16, we'll be looking at the bowl judgments. When that happens, all of this in chapter 14 up to verse 20 is leading to us seeing these bowl judgments when this is all taking place, ultimately what happens is the Lord is bringing his final judgment. And the final judgment we'll be looking at will be the judgment of the bowls. That all is going to be demonstrated by the conclusion or, or just before the second coming of Christ by this series or campaigns of Armageddon. And so that's what's being spoken of here, that last time where, where God's wrath is poured out Judgment is being poured out. God is separating the true from the untrue, and they will ultimately, that those who are true will be with him. They are going to rest in the Lord in great pleasure, but the others are going to be undergoing the most severe judgments and wrath of God. That will be poured out, and we will see that when we get here together again in chapter 15 and 16, which we'll look at together next Wednesday.